Excellent. Well, I'm going to give a quick introduction. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. Uh, today we'll be hosting a virtual training session on an upcoming tornado specific standard operating guide and template that NAPSIG will be releasing in the next uh, week or so. And so today's training really is designed to give you a sneak peek at what's in that standard operating guide and give you some specific recommendations for how you can use it and apply it uh, to your agency and your operations. Uh, and this training session will be instructed by uh, Bruce Oswald. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Bruce. Bruce, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Rebecca, and I hope uh, everybody can hear this fine. Um, I'm delighted today to be with you all uh, to talk about our latest uh, standard operating guidance document that NAPSIG's put together through a work group on tornadoes. Um, it was a privilege for me to be involved in this as, as the project manager and, and uh, writer, et cetera. And, um, you know, it, it's actually been a privilege overall for the last few years to be involved with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. There's a number of things that they offer, and, and through their thousands of people that they uh, have as members across the country, uh, we're able to make uh, documents such as this available uh, to, uh, to all of you, and uh, by knowing we have very, uh, very knowledgeable people that are providing input to it each and every part of the way. NAPSIC has a number of offerings uh, that they make available. Uh, they have a capability and readiness assessment tool, virtual training, regional public workshops, uh, videos, uh, information on the Department of Homeland Security's uh, geospatial concept of operations, uh, the NFPA data exchange, uh, data development and exchange standard. But today we're going to be concentrating on SOG, Standard Operating Guidance Documents. This is all made possible uh, from a, with a partnership through, uh, with NAPSIG and the National States Geographic Information Council, and it's funded by the Department of uh, Homeland Security's Geospatial Management Office. The hope here is by putting out these documents, these, these uh, uh, guidance documents, that will uh, be part of, of uh, standardizing how we uh, do and approach some of these particular types of uh, emergencies uh, across the country so that when uh, something grows and it goes from local to state and maybe to federal, we are in a more organized uh, methodology to uh, be able to cope with it. These couldn't be possible without uh, assistance through a work group, as I alluded to before, uh, NAPSIC's capability to go to find people that are experts in these areas and bring them into work groups uh, makes this all possible. So why do we uh, uh, concentrate in, in geospatial policies and public safety? Well, uh, first of all, we want to improve communication and, and collaboration between the GIS community and emergency response personnel. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of things over the years, and, and being able to talk and to talk to people and make things understandable to both parties is, is essential to making this work. Uh, we're offering a template. It's a tool that people and agencies can use to get started in, in bringing in GIS into their EOCs, but it's also one in which agencies that already have GIS involved in there can improve what they're doing, both from the emergency management perspective and also uh, from the GIS perspective. And then lastly, we hope we can use this to institutionalize uh, the geospatial assets, um, you know, both in terms of equipment, personnel, and, and I'd add the usage of this in the workflow for uh, the emergency managers. The goals here are, are reasonably simple. We want to provide a document uh, for GIS professionals uh, without a background in tornadoes uh, to uh, be able to quickly uh, get up to speed. Uh, but we also want to improve the capabilities of experienced GIS professionals that, that have worked through tornadoes and um, have a, a handle on how to do it, but can learn from best practices from others uh, gathered across the country. But uh, the other part of the equation is to help emergency managers understand how GIS can be effectively utilized. Um, they need to know what it can do. It doesn't, it's not enough for us to tell the 
uh, of the GIS professionals what to do. We need to uh, pull those two uh, communities together and have them both be able to work on this. The focus here is on state and local government needs, and we want to be consistent overall uh, with the federal uh, geoconops as well as the NAVSTIC overall SOG. And lastly, we want to determine what are the keys for success for the use of GIS in these specific kinds of emergencies. So an SOG is, is merely a set of guidelines. It's the guidelines on how to use geospatial technologies to better respond, uh, to help emergency managers better respond to the emergency at hand. Um, it's a template. Uh, it gives you ideas. Uh, and, and we hope it's in a format, we believe it's in a format, so you can easily modify uh, to meet your specific needs. Everybody's EOC operates a little bit differently, uh, but, but we're hoping that you can use this in a, in a way that will assist you and, make, and you can modify it to, to work closely with EUROS EOC. Uh, it answers some basic questions. Uh, why use GIS? If you want to, how do you get started? And what else should I be doing? Two audiences here, emergency managers, they need to know simply what's in it for them. This is a lesson I learned a long time ago at a, at a, at a meeting, the first meeting I held in New York State with, with local government officials on GIS. And a gentleman took me aside and he said, you have to look at each of the people in the room and, and find out and know what's in it for them if you want to reach an overall agreement. Similarly, uh, as emergency managers look at GIS as a tool, they want to know, they need to know, in fact, what they're going to get out of it. How's it going to benefit them if they expend resources, money, and, and personnel on this kind of thing? GIS professionals, on their, from their perspective, need to know more about what emergency management is and what they need to ensure that GIS is successful within this whole overall operation. We have a history uh, at NAPSIG with, with the uh, SOGs. Uh, the uh, overall SOG, the third version, uh, was put out in 2012. Um, and at the same time, they did a quick five-page guidance document that it really condensed what the overall was, one was and, and made it easy to read and, and quickly understand it and, and learn why you'd want to go in and read the entire document. Since then, in 2013, we, we did two SOGs, one for wildfires, another for coastal oil spills. Uh, and then last year, a coastal storm SOG, and of course this year, the tornado. A lot of changes occurred over the, way, over the time period we've been doing this. I like to think uh, it, it, we've uh, built on everything we've learned along the way. Uh, one of the things in, in doing the coastal oil stir, uh, spill was to uh, realize that it, it's different because it's a different set of legislation that governs this. And whereas most national uh, disasters are, are run by FEMA under the Stafford Act, this one's under uh, a whole different set of legislation and the U.S. Coast Guard takes the lead. Uh, and we've also learned to add things in here, such as a checklist. Here's a checklist of some things we might want to consider in preparing uh, our emergency, our GIS operations in the Emergency Management Center. Uh, last year, we learned from the state of Florida how they handled uh, hurricanes as they approached, and they had a series of standing orders that they have for their GIS team that has to be done over a course of time. And, and we, we are able to modify and reuse that this year. Uh, we looked at and added things in on data acquisition as, as we see that the after storm acquisition becomes more and more uh, uh, necessary, and uh, we've also looked at weather. Uh, and, and put definitions in there. Uh, meteorologists don't have to, or excuse me, GIS professionals don't have to be meteorologists, but they certainly need to understand the lingo. Uh, crowdsource data, uh, when we started, when I started doing these kind of things, crowdsource data was, was uh, looked at as it is very suspect. But now uh, there's a whole bunch of tools out there, online analytical capabilities that people can use, uh, and this is an area that's going to grow as, as we go along. And then lastly, this year we used, we introduced the training exercise into the SOG. 
The process uh, is a good one. It's straightforward. I like to think that we've improved it each year as we go along. Uh, it typically starts uh, in the late fall and goes through uh, to this time of the year. Uh, we ask, uh, we conduct a lot of research up front. Uh, we interview experts on the way. Uh, NASA uses their reach to, to pull in people that are both experts and, and potentially work group members. And the work group is formed and we usually hold our first meeting in January where we review uh, the draft outline uh, for the SOG and make changes and, and, and really form the direction that the overall SOG is going to go for the, uh, for the rest of the year. Um, I proceed to, to put together drafts. The, the work group reviews those and edits, edits the drafts. We have meetings. Uh, and uh, when we get to the end of the, the process, uh, we put, uh, NASA extends the SOG to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they review it, we get comments back, and uh, as a result of that, we have a final SOG, which is posted to the NAPSIC website. The process is really a great learning experience. If you haven't been on a work group, I would encourage people to be on those, uh, to get on a work group. Uh, it, it, it's a tremendous experience for me, and, and I believe it's, it's a really good one for the work group members as well. So who's on the work group? Well, these are people with real-world experience. Uh, they're, they're typically uh, uh, 20 or more people, uh, people from the private sector and from local, state, and, and federal governments. Uh, they're the brains. Uh, we try to maximize uh, the time uh, that, that they, or minimize the time they have to put in and maximize the, the uh, intelligence level and, and the ideas and experiences that each of those people have, ha have had. And, and um, I just use all that as best as possible, uh, recognizing their, their time is important and, and, and try to take advantage and, and put things together in as logical a fashion as we can. Um, as I said, we've got people from, from all walks of life here. Uh, and, and as you go along, some of the interesting things that come out, for instance, Brian Crumpler and Tony Foise, uh, Tony's from CSX uh, Railroad, have been, uh, have studied meteorology, and Tony actually was a meteorologist. Uh, so they bring an interesting perspective to things where we're doing uh, weather-related uh, SOGs. Also, this year we had uh, Tony Specey, uh, who's uh, from the Missouri One Task Force doing uh, urban search and rescue. His perspective uh, and the things he encountered in the field helped to shape uh, other things in the SOG. So overall, it, it really is a, it's a great uh, a group, uh, a great uh, deal of expertise we bring here. And uh, I just put this uh, uh, map up from uh, San Diego State uh, University. Uh, and, and it shows the, the extent uh, of all the tornadoes that have hit in the last uh, 55 years or so. Uh, I was shocked to learn uh, last year uh, it was almost 900 tornadoes hit the United States, the continent of the United States. There, there's few, if any, things that, that occur in Alaska, state of Hawaii, or any of the territories, the territorial islands we have. Uh, but in the continental United States, every state uh, uh, was hit. Uh, and and uh, unfortunately, 47 fatalities occurred uh, with $17 billion of economic loss as a result of this. So um, we need to be prepared, we need to be able to take action, and we need to do what we can to improve uh, the outcomes after these storms hit. Uh, tornadoes are really quick, and we all know they're violent. Uh, the average public uh, person out there uh, has 13 minutes of advance notice. Uh, most of these storms move from southwest to northeast in direction, although there are a number of changes in, in directions that have been noted over the years, and with an average speed of 30 miles an hour. Now, if I'm in a car heading away from the storm, 30 miles an hour is not a big deal. But if I'm heading towards the storm in a car or I'm on foot, that becomes a really fast-moving, uh, devastating type of uh, impact that it can have. They last less than 10 minutes uh, on average. Um, and so that makes them totally different than coastal storms. They're sudden, they're quick, and they're devastating. We've all seen pictures where uh, on one side of the street, uh, the buildings look uh, totally decimated, and on the other side, they're virtually untouched. Um, it can go anywhere uh, from, from a couple hundred yards wide and the swath that it takes out to, to over two miles. So it's, it's a very devastating, quick event. 
we learned a lot of lessons uh, along the way. Um, most of those 900 tornadoes are just local issues. Um, they occur late in the day in the, in the hot weather uh, or in the early evening. Uh, and some at nighttime. Uh, one, of, one of the things that, one of the problems that, that people said that they encountered because they're so late in the day, gathering uh, detailed information on where that tornado hit is it, very, very difficult to get done quickly. Um, typically, uh, the local uh, offices, uh, EOCs that are dealing with this have, you know, I guess I'd say zero, one or two GIS staff supporting them. So it, it's, it's, um, it needs to be dealt with. Uh, people need to be well prepared if they're going to uh, be effective in, in uh, handling these kind of things. Um, and we need to have a plan in place on how we're going to do things, uh, and in particular, uh, capture the path or the extent that the storm uh, uh, created when it went through. The SOG uh, has a number of key points. Um, Really, uh, one of them, obviously, is how can GIS assist emergency managers? And there is a section, and it's a very uh, uh, condensed section, and it's, it's specific to the emergency managers, and we'd love for people to read the whole document, but if you can get emergency managers to read that section um, as GIS professionals, that would be uh, really uh, a, a good way to get started. Um, you know, the rest of the document is dedicated uh, towards uh, GIS professionals. It, it talks about what they need to know, and I always think that the GIS professionals have to learn a lot more than the emergency managers, uh, but it's dedicated towards, you know, what do they need to know about emergency management, and what are the keys to success that both parties need to have if they're going to successfully use GIS. And then there's a number of, of items there, including data, forms and processes. One of the, uh, the things we like to start out with our work group is, is and we did certainly this year, was, was asking them what are the major questions that emergency managers have uh, in regards to a tornado? Not what GIS can do, not, not anything related to GIS, but what were their questions? And once we, we uh, came up with those uh, items, uh, then it was a question of, of prioritizing them and looking at, from those priori uh, priorities, what were the things that GIS could have the biggest impact on immediately uh, and, and uh, in assisting the emergency managers in their role in responding to these disasters. Uh, number one question was, you know, what was the path of the tornado and the extent of the damage? And I thought, well, gee, everybody knows you can go out and take a look at it. But no, as I said earlier, it could be nighttime. And the, uh, depending on the size of the tornado, it, it, it could be quite expensive. Um, so that was number one. And then, okay, so what are the things that were impacted along the way? Critical infrastructure. Uh, what are the things in there when responders are going in there that they have to be aware of? Uh, whether it's a hazmat threat, uh, electric lines down, uh, et cetera. Um, and then when we're uh, really organizing things after, after the uh, tornadoes hit, you know, where are the roads open, where are we going to have them close, the vehicle access points, and, and things like security perimeter. Um, still later, uh, one of the, uh, the great things that uh, some of the people pointed out is, is GIS uh, they, uh, was used uh, very quickly to uh, determine the value of the damage. Um, I call them down and dirty estimates. but, but but really what they did was they, they had a, a, a assessment data uh, that they already had uh, in uh, their EOC, and uh, they had forms put together and people sent out to assess the damage on each of the uh, structures out there, and they merely took the assessment data and uh, the percentage of damage for each structure and, and multiplied that together and quickly provided uh, the uh, emergency uh, management people an idea of the magnitude of the cost. Similarly, that, that same kind of approach could be done for debris removal by me measuring the quantities and, and the type of debris that's going to be involved. Uh, another thing that was pointed out during our studies was that uh, it was very important uh, to be able to get information out to the public, and GIS could be used to define the, uh, the population impact of the number of people, the number of households, the number of structures, as well as the businesses that were in that area. People that 
were actually sent to major uh, tornadoes like like uh, Moore or Joplin uh, said, you know, when they got there, one of the great things was people handed them a map, uh, a simple paper map, and they used those uh, for uh, finding out where they were supposed to go, how they were supposed to do uh, their searches, and, and then later people were using in other instances uh, the same similar kind of data as to uh, to organize the searches and to move on and, and uh, concentrate in areas that hadn't been covered before. So when we turn to the section in the SOG that's for emergency managers, right up front, we don't talk about, the first thing is not what is GIS. They don't need to know what GIS is. They need to know the kinds of questions it can answer for them. Uh, and, and they need to be able to evaluate if this is, if they can, if GIS can provide that, um, then um, what do we need to do to get it in there? So we tell them what the resources are that are needed uh, in order to do that. We also provide them uh, links to the NAFSIG quick guide uh, for uh, implementing GIS within your EOC and, and courses uh, that can be taken from FEMA. Then we outline a, a set of keys. What are the, what, what are the keys for uh, a successful use of GIS by emergency managers? Well, the first one looks really, um, really overly simplistic. But yes, you need to have a GIS team and they need to understand how the EOC operates, whatever methodology you use there. Um, and it's not enough to um, have a GIS team buy a computer buy some software, get some data, um, you need to actually uh, sit down and uh, spend time with those people, outlining what your issues are, learning how GIS may or may not be able to meet your need, need depending on your timing uh, requirements. Uh, and then you have to go one step further. You have to integrate this into the workflow and use by your managers and also first responders. And then you have to train, train using that and, and making sure and reinforcing the use of this to make better decisions. So the vast majority, though, of the SOG con is concentrated on the GIS professionals and what they, what they need to do and how they need to do it. We talk about emergency management systems, uh, the uh, DHS uh, geospatial concept of operations and how that's put together. Uh, emergency Operations Center, there's a diagram of a typical one and, and also how that works. And we also talk about things like, you know, where to go for additional resources. I, I've, you know, uh, people like Charles Brady and, and uh, uh, Ardmore, Oklahoma, or um, David Allen in Texas, I mean, they have resources, they work with people in, in adjoining communities as well as with their state governments. Uh, and if you're, if you're there, uh, you need additional resources, um, and, you know, there's, there's people, uh, state GIS coordinators or geographic information officers in every state, and, and uh, people should learn to uh, take advantage of that if, if they need. Also, if you go out of state uh, for resources, there's things, and Richard Butkerite from the state of Florida uh, preaches the use of the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. That's a contract from state to state that allows states in emergencies to seek uh, assistance from other states and it defines what the cost is that they'll pay for those kind of people. So you might, uh, for instance, uh, request the use of a, a GIS person that you know in a certain state uh, at, at a certain rate and, and if, if you're lucky. And that all has to be done through the State Emergency Management Agency. There's also uh, uh, satellite data that can be made available through something called the International Charter, and that's uh, headed up through the uh, uh, United States Geological Survey. So we put that kind of information in there, emergency management terms. You need to be able to, to, be able to talk the talk uh, if you want to be understood in, in these operations. And the key here uh, that we learned along the way, as I said before, was determining what is the tornado's path. And, and it was very enlightening uh, as people talked to understand, you know, uh, what's, what's the best way to get this? Well, or what's the best thing that they wanted? Number one was give us, give us a digital or ortho image of, of the extent of the damage and we can lay that on our base map and, and then we can get to work right away. Well, reality is, as we discussed it, is, is almost no one 
has um, an emergency contract with uh, an imagery firm uh, that, that can be brought in quickly right after a disaster hits. Um, and also, even if they did, uh, there, was, there were stories about uh, people uh, getting friends to go up in planes, and, and they got chased down because of impending future storms coming there. So, so uh, that was uh, a totally practical uh, perspective uh, or approach to take on many of these things. Uh, we talked about drones a little bit, but that really hasn't shaken, that industry hasn't shaken out quite enough yet to make that uh, practical. Some places they use calls. They, they uh, uh, geocoded where the calls were coming from, and that, and that gave them a rough idea of, of the extent of, uh, of the damage, as well as social media, Twitter, uh, and Instagram pictures and other things. The uh, authoritative source for determining the path of a, of a tornado is the National Weather Service. And um, they, uh, as, a, as a rule, have uh, provided authoritative uh, data on, on the storm within 24 to 48 hours after the storm hits. And this is great, and people really appreciate it. Um, and they stress uh, the need to uh, identify, as part of these procedures, uh, identify your local National Weather Service office and to work with those people, establish a relationship up front so you can get the data as quickly as possible. Um, but still there's that gap between the start of, of, of when the storm hits and, and when you can get that authoritative data. So uh, one of the things, um, and I'm sorry today we, we uh, are unable to have uh, uh, Charles Brady on the line, um, but he, he uh, uh, had a, has a system that he's developed over the years, and, and by and large, we saw that ma many of the more successful local governments uh, really did this with boots on the ground. Um, they up front uh, had a methodology, and, and this is key, uh, of how, how this would be done. Where, how, what's the best way uh, to get the information on uh, what's happening? Um, uh, one of the things Charles stresses is uh, he likes to give paper maps uh, to some of the early people going out there, but that you have to understand first responders, uh, their first uh, goal is to save lives and, and not to collect data for you. So the better methodology is to have people that are really tasked with uh, quickly going out and, and collecting a rough outline of where the storm hit for you. Uh, and then putting that in there, and in Charles's case, uh, he talks about um, going out basically with a GPS unit and another guy from, from the county uh, who, who they used to work together, and, and basically one taking one side and one other taking the other side of the swath and, and quickly identifying the path that it took. Uh, and there's many other stories just like that out there. Uh, I think that one of the keys that, that people pointed out, it's, it's great to have mobile uh, data collection, but you better be prepared with, with paper as well. Uh, because stuff happens when these storms hit, and uh, it would be nice to be able to automatically upload that data as you're recording it, but many times uh, communication systems are down in the area, and, and it's just not possible. The other thing that people talk about, not only do you need a methodology, not only do you need people assigned to collect that, that data uh, and, and know what they're doing, but you need to train. You need to have that in exercises. And, and through that, you can uh, more speedily get the information into your system and out to the emergency managers. The other thing that was talked about is the importance of having your, your data and having your uh, protocols in, in, a, in a system uh, and in uh, uh, a category uh, that is akin to what, let's say, um, uh, FEMA uses. Uh, so that if, if you're applying for aid and other things or the storm, the, the, the size of the storm uh, and the impact of the storm ramps up, uh, you, people don't have to repeat what's being done, and it's clearly uh, available to everybody in, in a similar format. The other thing and, and um, uh, that is extremely important is, is communication. Uh, every level of government, um, uh, values, communication. Uh, there are emergency management calls that uh, happen regularly during disaster between uh, local governments and local governments and state governments. And if it gets you know, large enough, local governments, state governments, and, and federal governments. 
you need to be aware of those. Uh, I know uh, in certain cases in the state of Florida, Richard Bugterite sits in on the overall emergency management calls and then has calls with his local governments uh, just to distribute the, the information, uh, have people understand what the emphasis are and what the needs are. Um, it, it's um, uh, really important as part, and part of the coordination and the collaboration that should occur uh, during these events. I mean, the key here is really to uh, be more efficient and ensure that people understand what, um, what others are doing so that they can share the results from each other and, you, and it's not repetitive. I know in New York when I was working there, I mean, I used to treat it, if, if nothing else, is, is my tax dollar being wasted. I, I just wanted to make sure that it was being done once, it was being done correctly, and it was being shared uh, amongst everyone. Uh, it's very important. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, Shelley Willoughby and, and Debbie Bridewell uh, uh, have great experience in working uh, like tornadoes like Joplin and more and things like that. People in the field needing, needing uh, data. Um, uh, uh, Debbie talks about uh, working with uh, Tony Specey on the urban search and rescue team, and they didn't have the, the, the maps they needed, and basically she had to uh, take the maps, make them in black and white so people could, could get them on their phones and be able to use them that way. Uh, but, you know, that kind of coordination and, and work that, that really in collaboration that, that is done, all the groundwork is laid up front. And uh, if you can do that up front, make sure you know who's, who's there, who's in your surrounding communities uh, from the GIS end. It, it can really prove invaluable when something as simple as your plotter dies or, or something else. So we really, we really encourage people to do that kind of thing. So the, the next part of the document um, really deals with uh, what are the keys for success that GIS professionals need to know when they're, when they're uh, using GIS and when they're implementing it. And I, I always put this one up front uh, because it's a constant uh, uh, thing that you need to do, is to sell the capabilities of GIS uh, without going over the top and not without promising stuff that you can't deliver. But stuff that you can deliver can be, or suggestions when you're, when you're sitting in meetings, uh, can be quite useful to people. Um, as we ask managers to meet with the GIS professionals, we ask the GIS professionals uh, uh, to really get, when they get together, to learn uh, about the manager's needs and think of it from their perspective and, and what's really important to them and then and, and work with them, so go, get, uh, give and take, suggest and reach agreements on the products you need, the timing, the products they need, the timing that they need, uh, uh, and, and that'll help you determine what data you have to have, what templates need to be in place, what are the standard forms you're going to need, and what's on your base map. Uh, Etc. One of the lessons uh, learned also is, is the need to standardize your products as much as possible and to establish a schedule for those standardized products uh, and ensure that the people on the floor know, where the pro know what the products are, know when they're coming out, and know how to uh, access uh, and ask for other products. You need also um, uh, to work um, with the emergency managers to ensure after those products are done that they're being used properly. And, and, I, and when I was in New York, we actually had people, uh, a person assigned to go out and, and see how, how the teams were using the information and what else they might need along the way of what we needed to do uh, to refine what we were giving them or modify it. So that's very, very important. Also another lesson learned along the way was we really need to have a system that tracks uh, those products. So, so people need to know what the products are, and they need to know when they're coming out. And um, whether it's it's the uh, something that goes with the sit rep, or something that comes out once once a shift, or or it's uh, a map that somebody requested uh, based on on just an ad hoc uh, need. Uh, you know, they need to know where it is in the system and when they can expect it to come out. Another lesson learned is that all the products you produce, you need, to, you need to do a quick PDF with a date and a time on it. This has two really valuable things. One, later on in the process, as people start to put together, look at, look at uh, maybe what was happening at, at a certain time in the recovery, uh, they, can, they can use that to determine where we were and what we were doing. On the other hand, 
Uh, the other, the other uh, really important thing is you, know, you can use it as a GIS profession to see what worked and what could have been done better as well. There's a number of things that we point out here in the SOG, uh, and one of the most valuable things, we have a link uh, to the NAPSIG Capability and Ready Assessment Tool. Uh, and, you know, and we really uh, suggest that you, you look at this at least once a year to, to measure where you are and where you're going, and, and uh, I think that, that could uh, provide some useful insight. Uh, we've also taken uh, uh, in, inserted a checklist here. Uh, it's something I first uh, came up with when I was working for the National Academy of Science uh, on a project uh, a number of years ago, and we've, uh, we've adopted this and, 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 and modified it to meet what we have here for needs, but, but it gives you a, 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 just a checklist of things that you can do in your preparation. Um, we've taken, as I, I mentioned last year, uh, the Richard Bunkwright in the state of Florida provided his standing orders for hurricanes, and we've adapted that for tornadoes using the expertise and of, the, of the work group here. And so what do we do six months out, the kind of things we need to do? Do we have, uh, we, have we identified the data uh, we need, the, the templates, are they been built? Uh, do we have neat patent data sharing agreements in certain cases for certain types of data? Uh, you know, and, and, and what are we doing? How are we going to uh, uh, use social media and how are we going to do that? How are we going to analyze that? So there's a number of things in there, and that takes you right through uh, um, well, several days after the storm has hit. We have a lot of data suggestions here, and, and the work group people were very, very helpful with coming up with data that you should have in place uh, in your EOC uh, prior to the event, and, and I, I stress uh, having access to this if it powers out uh, or if uh, communications are down. So you need to have it somewhere uh, within your ELC. And then you have to be uh, uh, aware of the kinds of data that you have post-event, that you need post-event, what's the best way to get that as well. And, and uh, also, Debbie Bridewell from, from Missouri uh, provided us with a set of data that they use specifically for tornadoes within their state EOC. So, you know, I would suggest you take a look at all these things and, and maybe it'll give you some ideas for things that might improve your capabilities as well. Um, our, our meteorological people last year in the coastal, uh, uh, coastal storm uh, SOG said, hey, uh, GIS people don't have to be experts in meteorology, but they certainly have to understand the lingo. So we put weather definitions in there. Um, also, is, is, uh, is, is the use of uh, social media has grown uh, exorbitantly over the last few years. That's a, that's a great place to go to quickly get a snapshot of what people are saying, thinking, doing, uh, and, and it can be analyzed in a number of ways. And there are things online now that will help you do that. Uh, but then there's also basic stuff that's in the SOG, and this is in the, from the original SOG, but, you know, here's the shift sh change coming on. What do I need to do? in the beginning, and, and how am I going to uh, uh, turn it over in the end? So there's some, you know, really um, uh, start to finish type of things in there that are extremely valuable for people who are just getting started or might want to consider this uh, for adoption in, in their existing facility. Training, um, uh, yes, uh, state, uh, or, excuse me, GIS people uh, in the EOC, uh, need to understand uh, how, how the system works and how their EOC operates. Obviously, they need to be up to date in current software, but they need to, to know uh, the data models that are out there that they can use uh, for tornadoes. And, and, you know, as I said before, we understand the National Weather Service is coming out with a whole new grouping of that uh, in the next uh, few weeks, hopefully. Uh, and then, and then uh, there's a, a lot of different courses with FEMA Online Training Academy. Uh, most of all, I want to stress the need for exercises. Um, when um, we put together a large uh, a training, uh, excuse me, a large GIS team in New York State, one of the first things we learned was they weren't ready for prime time. And, and we did our exercises within the team, uh, first of all, and, and, and that told us a lot of things. People learned their roles. They learned that they needed to have the data right there, able to go. They needed to. They need, learned they needed to have templates up and ready to run. And it's simple things, just like, oh, uh, 
uh, and this may sound ridiculous to you, but I, I remember a specific fight over a title block when I was trying to get a, a map out of somebody. And, and you know, it, it, it's that kind of thing you learn as you go on, and certainly the people in the, on the call that have been experts um, uh, understand that. There's a need for speed. I, uh, I emphasize that because I saw in the beginning uh, we, met, we missed a lot of important uh, deadlines and people going to meet, meetings. And once, you know, if you miss by, it doesn't make a difference. If you miss by two hours or 30 minutes, you've missed. And, and all the work uh, leading up to that is, uh, is lost. Uh, important lesson learned uh, post 9-11 was uh, going to the fire department and seeing their GIS person there with a really garish, simple map. And him explaining to me that, look, I got 10 to 20 seconds to get my message across to these firefighters who are hepped up on adrenaline and have to get stuff done. Uh, and if I don't make it clear, I don't care what kind of great cartographic products I give them. They won't understand the subtlety. So, so learn what needs to get the message across and learn how to do it quickly. And then engage the overall EOC in your exercises. And those things that you've said you're going to deliver, deliver them on the time frame. And then, and then work after each training uh, uh, scenario to make sure that uh, you make adjustments and that the people that are supposed to be using this stuff are uh, uh, actually using it properly. Okay. So let's remember, this is just a, this is a template. This is a bunch of ideas that have been suggested. Uh, they are uh, uh, they are uh, good ideas from experts around the country. You may have better ones in certain areas, and that's great. We'd love to hear from you, but adapt this to meet your needs. Um, make an operations document for tornadoes for your EOC, um, and then exercise it and use it and refine it, and uh, and then share it with those with those around you and, and with us if possible. The SOG is available. Uh, it's available uh, at no cost. I always like to put that up front. Some people, some people, when I work for New York State, I just want to know what they're going to cost me. Uh, it's a, it, and, and it's on the NAFSIG website right now. Uh, and we encourage you to take a look at it uh, and get started um, and, uh, and, and make a difference. Start the conversation now. If you haven't already, um, do it today or do it this week, uh, or if you already have, let's renew that conversation. Uh, talk with the people in your EOC and the emergency management uh, side. Uh, learn again what they need or learn for the first time what they need. And, and maybe this has changed and maybe their knowledge base has grown or maybe the technology has gotten better in certain ways. Develop a plan with them on how to integrate GIS into their workflow. Uh, how are the people going to use it? What do they need? And uh, remember, they don't always need wonderful maps. They might just need a list of names and phone numbers or something else. Uh, speak at uh, your state emergency management conferences. Uh, uh, get the word out that way. Talk with people in your adjacent communities. Uh, if you're in the state government, talk with people in the local GIS uh, uh, communities uh, and help them with locating data, other information that they may need. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're developing templates and other policies and procedures, share those. Uh, share those on, on your, uh, your state uh, listserv or, or whatever uh, method is the best way to do that. Uh, then it, and exercise, exercise with other entities um, and uh, look and learn from those exercises and make sure um, everybody is benefiting and, and understands where you're going here. And then lastly, we ask that you spread the word about NAPSIG's SOGs and, and help others uh, to adopt it and, and use it and, and modify it in ways that can make a difference for them. Okay, well, that's it from my perspective. Um, and uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, and if you, um, uh, otherwise, if you want to afterwards follow up, think of something, you can certainly uh, contact me uh, at, at this address. Rebecca? Excellent. Yes, thank you very much, Bruce, for providing us with that very in-depth overview, um, both from a GIS technical perspective and also on the public safety operations. That was, I think, a really great way to introduce what is actually now available. So just a quick update for folks. Um, 
as this session has been going on, uh, we have actually launched and released the Tornado SOG. So it's currently available on our website. Um, if you go from the home page and you scroll down towards where it says uh, resources, uh, it is right there and available to you. So I will actually um, pull that up for folks in just a moment. Um, the, we did receive a couple of questions regarding the U.S. national grid and if there is any guidance in terms of how to use the U.S. national grid. And so I, seeing that there were several questions there, I just wanted to highlight that, yes, um, it, it, from a NAPSIG perspective, uh, and I believe actually NISJIC as well, we, we strongly encourage the, uh, the application of the U.S. national grid as a common area reference system. It is both a point and an area reference system, um, both from an operator perspective as well as a GIS uh, perspective. So we have released a, a senior um, kind of operator level guidance document on there, uh, and I did put it in uh, in the chat, the link to that a few moments ago. And then um, we will also, following up from today, provide you with the link um, to that implementation guidance document. Um, so more to come on USNG, uh, we certainly understand it's a hot topic. Uh, with that, I'm gonna move on to one of the other questions. Um, and, and Bruce, I'm gonna to defer to you on this. The question is, are there any suggestions for how to help integrate um, between emergency management and other agencies that do not understand and use GIS? And this particular person indicated that there are only two people in their entire county that understands GIS which is not enough in their area. So uh, I know this isn't necessarily specific to the SOG and tornadoes, but perhaps, Bruce, you can lend some, some wisdom of experience on uh, that question. Okay, I, I'm not sure I have wisdom, but I have experience. And uh, I, I, can, I, can, I can tell you one of the things uh, is, is we were evangelizing about GIS uh, in New York State, one of the things was uh, simply uh, to uh, meet with those people, uh, to find out what was important, the key things, and how they did their workflow um, in, their, in their business operations, and, and, and to uh, show them, give them examples of how GIS uh, might be uh, uh, able to improve how they do things, uh, might be able to assist them in doing things better, uh, you have to be careful. You don't. You want to um, somehow uh, embarrass them or, or or make them see think like they're not uh, up to speed on things. But really, uh, what it can do to make their job easier. And I'll go back to that statement I said originally. What's in it for them, and why they should be using it, um, and how it can make them look better. And, and that's that's the tack I always took with agencies, not only agencies, state agencies, but also. Uh, uh, some local governments that, that uh, were out there when we had friends in, in uh, GIS uh, offices and local government that needed help. I don't know if that, that answers your question, but that, that's really the way we approached it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bruce. That was some great insight. Um, if any other folks, we've got about five more minutes remaining. If you have any questions, do feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, or the chat feature will take questions either way um, is completely acceptable. And so I, I think the only other question that I have for you, Bruce, is, um, you know, how do you see uh, and, and where do you, have you seen standard operating guides being applied, um, you know, for tornadoes specifically or for other um, other types of hazards. So, you know, can, given your experience in this past iteration, you know, have you seen uh, any specific examples of some best practices in the implementation of, of standard operating guides? Um, that others. Yeah, I, I, you know, I can. I, I haven't seen anybody um, uh, develop written documents like this. Uh, I have, but I have seen. Uh, the more successful um, organizations uh, sitting down, reaching agreement, a, a lot of the steps we talked about in here, and then, and then putting what they're doing into 
their overall uh, operating procedures uh, for uh, what their staff, the emergency management staff, needs to do in, in you know, approaching it from that perspective. I think, I think the value uh, with having uh, uh, this kind of SOG, uh, along with having uh, the uh, steps in, in the emergency management standard operating procedures, the value that this brings uh, a, a really uh, authoritative document uh, to to the EOC, uh, and that GIS professionals can refer back to when they're, when they're having discussions or before they have discussions uh, with their emergency management counterparts. And I think I think that's the important takeaway from here. Uh, you know, you can you can uh, bring it uh, to as it, as it were bring, bring it to the meeting. Uh, and you can point to the emergency management section in there when you're dealing with people uh, and, and, and uh, you know, have them uh, understand it a little better. And, and the best part is, is when they get, when they, as they, as you say, get it, and they start asking you for things, and they start asking, well, if GIS can do this, can it do this for me? Because I really have a problem there. And, and if you're lucky, it's something that GIS can do very easily. And then they start to build on from that. I've seen, I've seen people at all levels of state government, uh, and in particular, the, the head of all the state agencies, finally one day said, hey, did this do that? Because I really need this from GIS when we were sitting in the emergency operations center. So I, uh, to answer your question, I, I haven't seen a written document uh, uh, put together like this, uh, but I have seen uh, the use of GIS incorporated into standard operating procedures of, of the emergency managers. And I think there's a great value in having these kind of documents that people can bring, uh, ref not only refer to, but can, can bring and show uh, their emergency management counterparts when they're dealing uh, and, and implementing these kind of things. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, that insight, Bruce. And certainly the development of an SO, SOG or SOPs in the local agency certainly starts with that conversation and, you know, mutually agreed upon procedures, um, but certainly codifying it in some sort of a, a guideline or a, you know, a, a template or a document, you know, allows a basis to, you know, essentially exercise um, to those to those uh, standard operating procedures and, and also um, taking them the next step in, in using them uh, during actual incidents uh, and allowing for that, you know, in terms of staff turnover continuity in your operations. Um, so there's, there's a lot of benefits to, to codifying them in a, in a written format as well. So, and that Absolutely. is, you know, one reason Absolutely. why we make the – yeah, and that's one reason why we make the documents available to you guys, to the community as a Word document so you can actually easily copy and paste the content as you see fit um, for your own local agency. So we, we encourage, you know, those that are, are on today's session to, to, to do that and to, to take a look at the documents and, and feel free to, to list the language and, and use it as you, you all see fit. So. With that, I don't see any other, um, you know, questions or whatnot. Um, so, you know, Bruce, I don't know if you have any kind of final remarks that you'd like to leave the uh, participants with today, and we'll go ahead and, and wrap up. Well, I, I want to thank everybody uh, for, for being on the, on the call. Uh, I hope you've gotten a lot out of this. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot more. I've just... Uh, barely scraped what, uh, the top of what's in the SOG. Uh, it's, it's, it's the best one we've produced yet. Uh, I want to thank all the people on the work group for the great work that they've done and the expertise that they provided. Um, and uh, I look forward, if people uh, have other ideas and, and certainly any questions, please feel free to send them to me. Uh, we'll get answers right back to you. And uh, I, um, I want to thank Napsig and Rebecca uh, for putting this all together. And um, I hope everybody has a great day. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. And, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be following up with an email in the next couple of days with the appropriate links and uh, any other key issues. But thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to your participation in a future virtual training session. Thank you.